Please take a seat, everybody. And uh, as you turn back to Psalm 23 again, um, I want to just take a moment. I want to indulge, uh, ask you to indulge me just for a few thank yous. It's very easy to leave thank yous right to the very end when people have left and not everybody gets to hear them. And it's very easy over days like this, isn't it? Uh, it's one of the great sadnesses and problems of evangelical subculture. We put all the emphasis on speakers and yet so many other people have done so much to make Catalyst happen. Um, Paul talked about me running it. Actually, the real reason we run Catalyst is so that probably around February, March time, I can say to Paul Levy, there are 150 books on their way to your house uh, four times over and all these boxes arrive. And with great joy and happiness, Paul has to transport them all the way down here to the building. And we do that every year uh, just to keep Paul humble and happy. Um, so I want to say thank you to all the folks at Ealing, Paul and Claire for playing the piano, uh, to Geraldine who's come on board this year helping, and to Lawrence and Yuki doing uh, sound and projection, Franklin and Beth doing uh, the camera as well. I want to say thank you to Hannah McEwen who works with us at Trinity, uh, who's been really the contact point for many of you. Uh, so huge thanks to Hannah and Sam uh, Moore, Sam Williams as well serving, and all the bookstall folks. Today's the last day, obviously, to make real good use of it. These books have all been transported over from Belfast. They don't want to take them all back. Uh, so as much spending today as possible uh, uh, would be great. So huge thank you to everybody. Uh, let's turn to God's Word then. Psalm, Psalm 23, I'll read it together again. It's such uh, precious poetry, such beautiful words, isn't it? Does us no harm to hear it again and again. And let's hear God's Word. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I wonder if you know that C.S. Lewis hated Psalm 23, and yet, he understood Psalm 23 better than he knew. Now, let me just qualify that right at the start. When I say he hated Psalm 23, what I mean is he hated verse 5 of Psalm 23. C.S. Lewis was unable to reconcile the beauty of verses 1 to 4 with what he called a spirit of hatred in verse 5. A spirit almost, these are his words, almost comic in its naivety. For C.S. Lewis, the, the notion that a host might treat his guest to a feast while his enemies are made to look on, Lewis said that is irretrievably spiteful. Here's what he said, the poet's enjoyment, the poet's enjoyment of his present prosperity in verse 5 would not be complete unless those horrid enemies who used to look down their noses at him were watching it all and hating it. Lewis says it's as if he's saying that's what part of the joy is. They're hating this. The pettiness and the vulgarity of it, especially in such beautiful surroundings, are hard to endure. And yet, Lewis understood Psalm 23 better than he knew. For everything he said about it, I have a favorite scene in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's just a tiny scene tucked into the story. About halfway through The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Lewis gives us two chapters. The spell begins to break and Aslan is nearer. You remember what happens in Aslan is nearer? The, the white witch's power is beginning to fade and the frozen wastelands of Narnia are thawing. Winter is retreating. Christmas is returning. A land where it was always winter and never Christmas. What a, what a beautiful thing is now happening. Father Christmas is back. There are presents. There are gifts. And with Aslan nearer and on the move, we know we are heading for a showdown with the white witch at the stone table. Do you remember what happens 
as the White Witch is heading, racing across the frozen ground to the stone table. On the way, she comes across, here's Lewis's words, a merry party, a squirrel and his wife with their children, two satyrs and a dwarf, and an old dog fox, all on stools around a table. Edmund couldn't quite see what they were eating, but it smelled lovely. And there seemed to be decorations of holly, and he wasn't at all sure that he didn't see something like plum pudding. What happens next? What is the meaning of this? Asked the white witch. She cried again. What is the meaning of all this gluttony, this waste, this self-indulgence? Where did you get all these things? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. C.S. Lewis, right under his own nose, manages to suggest that when all is said and done, the point of everything is not warfare and the clash of good and evil. The point of everything is fellowship and feasting. In a world made new, there is overflowing joy in the delightful gifts of the king and in the lavish goodness of his reign. Well, what was the whole point of the Exodus, chapter 15? Exodus 15, you have guided them by your strength to your holy dwelling. Now, I want to show us three things again. Here, here is our final, our final confession of faith today. It's lodged there right at the end of verse 6. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Ralph Davis says, the green pastures, verses 1 to 3, may be the normal place. The valley of the shadow of death, the fearful place. In front of the enemies, the dangerous place. But the house of the Lord, the abiding place. See, in every place in the world, in every season of life, in every part, the shepherd is there. So three things again this morning. Number one, how he welcomes. Number two, what he sends. And number three, where he invites. How he welcomes, what he sends, where he invites. I want you to savor with me. Let's do it together this morning. Savor the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, look how he welcomes. And I simply want to stress that word, how. How, that, that's the stress of verse five, I think. L look at the way he welcomes. Look at how he does it. Your shepherd is a host. He shepherds you by hosting you. So by the time we get to verse five, the imagery has changed a bit, hasn't it? He, he's turned from speaking to us about him, verses one to three, David. Verse four, he turns to the Lord face on, as it were, and addresses him directly. I will fear no evil for you are with me. And, and now it just continues. He can't stop now that he's started speaking to him. It just flows out of him. You prepare a table. You anoint my head. You, you, you. It's the language of personal relationship, isn't it? Friends, this morning, the pronouns in your head about God, the ones you use most, show the type of relationship you're in with the Lord Jesus. Is it He or you? Only ever He or you? Look where we are. We've, we've moved, haven't we, from pastures and waters and rods and staff. We've moved from all that shepherding imagery to oil on the head and cup in the hand. Your care for me, Lord, David is saying, is so comprehensive, so absolute, that more than the way a shepherd treats a sheep, you treat me the way a host treats a special guest. So look how he welcomes verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. There are three verbs there in that verse, two of them explicit, and one of them is implied. You prepare, you anoint, and my cup overflows the senses, you fill. You prepare, you anoint, you fill my cup to overflowing. You have done it. You, you've made my cup like this. 
Derek Kidner says, every detail is lovely. There is a well-set table. There is festive oil. There is a brimming cup. That little word prepare, it it, it comes from the tabernacle world. It's the word that to describe what the priests did in preparing the sacrifice in the tabernacle and the temple. Everything has to be just right, set in just the right place. This is not haphazard, it is prepared. That is the mark of a good host, isn't it? They are prepared. Many years ago in Aberdeen, we, we once had someone come to visit us for an evening, and this person was helping us, a difficult problem in church. They'd They've traveled a long way. And at that time, we we used to live at the top of a huge hill in Aberdeen. And this person had their bike with them. They cycled all the way up the hill to be with us. And they came in, offered them a cup of coffee, sat down, were talking about the issue and talking everything through and so on. And after a while, I could tell that the the poor guest was a little bit agitated. And eventually the guest said, look, I'm really, really sorry (laughs) to say this. I thought I was coming for an evening meal and I haven't eaten anything. And I realized we had our wires crossed. Of course he thought he was coming. Everything I told him would lead him to expect he was coming for food. And the poor chap is sitting there starving to death in our living room. And do you know what he got? Toast. (laughs) That's all we had. We weren't weren't prepared. There was nothing, literally nothing else. What, What kind of hosts were we? Embarrassed hosts and a disappointed guest. But look at verse 5. Look what's flowing with this host, oil and wine. See, just like we take somebody's coat today when they arrive at your house. Let me take that for you. We we take it and we, we hang it up. In this culture, when they arrived, you washed their feet and you perfumed their head. And you never left them staring at their glass, wondering if there'd be a refill. It's not what we do, is it, when we host? You, you keep the cup full. Anoint my head with oil. That, that the idea for anointing with oil, literally it is you make my head fat with oil. That you just keep pouring and pouring and pouring. It's not, not just a tiny bit, a tiny drop. Friends, it is a picture of the most welcoming of hosts. I want to ask you this morning if you know how good God is to you. Do you know how good he is? His welcome of you is second to none. Second to none. You can't beat it. You you know you've been with good hosts, don't you? You never forget it. Some of us this morning, we think we're irrelevant to God. We've messed up. We've screwed up. We've dropped out. We've burnt out. Our ministry is not what we thought it would be. And here's what we've been doing at this conference. You've been comparing yourself to other shepherds. And we just haven't quite seen yet that with this shepherd and with this host, there is the kind of welcome for you, for me, that is like nothing else on earth. Is verse 5 miserly or magnificent? Well, what do you think God is like this morning? In your mind's eye, tucked away in a way that nobody else sees, do you think God is like the Grinch or Father Christmas? I think it's why C.S. Lewis paints Father Christmas into the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, isn't it? Aslan is safely installed as the Christ figure in the stories. I, I don't know. I've never looked at it. I guess it's almost as if he just, he just can't help himself putting Father Christmas in there. Everything is going to be okay again. In a world where Aslan is overturning the curse, winter is becoming spring, of course it's going to be Christmas. Presents are going to flow, aren't they? What is God like to you? Is God to you a generous father who, while you sleep on Christmas Eve, lays the stocking on your bed or hangs it from your fireplace, whatever you do, and puts more presents around the tree than you ever imagined possible so that you wake in the morning to a world of wonder, the house overflowing with good things. Is that how you conceive of God? Or is God like the head teacher? Rule book in hand, ready to pounce. Stop doing that. It's true, isn't it, that some people are just miserly with their money, aren't they? 
Some people don't give properly. They don't give anything like what they could give or should give. And the reason they don't give is that they're not like God in how he gives. The reason they're not like him is that they haven't seen him properly. Most people think a rod and staff in God's hands. Yes, of course, sure, we're used to that, a rod and staff. I'm happy with that. But perfume and wine in God's hand? No, there, there must be some mistake. The, the way that you welcome people, friends, it means that your reputation precedes you, doesn't it? It's maybe a hard thing to, to accept, but I can assure you that you are, in, in your circles of where you live and work and move, you are either known as being tight or generous. Isn't that right? Pe people, we, it's how we know one another. You know what you'll get out of people, a little or a lot. What did Jesus say? He realized that people were looking at him and sizing him up on the basis of his welcome of others. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking. And what did people say? He is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And that makes him your friend today. Makes him my friend. Makes him the kind of friend who says to sinners, come in eat and drink, have a cup. Kenneth Bailey, a scholar who's written a number of books based on his experience of living in the Middle East, he's written a wonderful book called The Good Shepherd, tracing the theme of the shepherd through the Bible and in the Middle East and all the rest of it and so on. He says this, in the East, a man's fame is spread by what? Not money, not, not house. A man's fame is spread by means of his table and lavish hospi hospitality rather than his possessions. If you want to know how wealthy someone is, you look how he treats guests, not how many cows and camels he has. Bailey says this, strangers and neighbors alike discuss tables where they have been as guests. They talk about it, tales spread from one town to another and are handed down from one generation to another. There is considerable gossip as to how guests and strangers are entertained. And friends, here's the amazing thing. In the traditional Middle East society, the master of the house provides the food. He does not prepare the food. Remember Genesis 18, Abraham, the host, orders food to be prepared for his guests. Luke 15, the father in the, the prodigal son's story, orders a banquet to be prepared. The host does not prepare the feast himself. How astonishing verse 5 is that in this psalm, David is clothing the Lord of the burning bush, the great I am who has no need of anyone or anything. He is clothing that great I am in the dress of a host. The greatest of hosts himself, himself prepares the most lavish of feasts for the lowliest of creatures. How amazing that the Lord of heaven and earth wants to spread his fame throughout all the earth by being known as a certain kind of host. And just look where he welcomes a table before me in the presence of my enemies. See, look, think about this. In Mark's gospel, immediately after learning about the death of John the Baptist, so Herod has dispatched John the Baptist immediately after Jesus calls his, his disciples to himself. What does he say? Mark 6, 31, come away by yourselves to a desolate place, a wilderness place, and rest a while. A few verses later, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Then Jesus commands everyone to sit down in groups on the green grass. Jesus then feeds the multitude, feeds them so completely there are 12 basketfuls left over, such is the abundant overflow of his supply. And yet by doing all of this immediately after the death of John the Baptist at the hands of Herod, who was Herod? A false shepherd, a bad shepherd of Israel, who has just hosted a banquet of death, hasn't he? 
Jesus does all of this knowing that he is doing it with Herod's murderous threat growing, the, the threat of the scribes and the Pharisees gr looming and growing all the time in the background. Jesus feeds his disciples in the presence of his enemies. He knows what fate will befall him. And as Jesus is doing that, feeding his disciples, who do his disciples look like? Do you remember Psalm 78? They tested God in their heart by demanding the food that they craved. They spoke against God saying, can God spread a table in the wilderness? He struck the, walk, the rock so that water gushed out and streams overflowed. Can he also give bread and provide meat for his people? It's amazing, isn't it? His disciples say to him, there's no food here, Lord, just like Israel did in the desert. Jesus is spreading a table in the presence of his enemies. Isn't it incredible? I think it's become commonplace. People, people notice now how much Jesus is eating and drinking in the Gospels. David Ford says Jesus in, in Luke's Gospel literally eats his way through the Gospel. But have you ever noticed how much of that eating and drinking in the Gospels happens in the presence of those who are wanting to do away with him? in the presence of those who are criticizing him for his choice of culinary companions. People are even coming to view his dining habits with murderous eyes. Luke 19, and when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. As Jesus spreads the table, so the cross begins to loom. And I think all of that helps with that really unfortunate view of verse 5 by C.S. Lewis. Lewis says there is, there is a pettiness and a vulgarity to the idea that you might be eating a feast in the presence of your enemies. C.S. Lewis even goes so far as to call Psalms with ideas like that in them terrible or, dare we say, contemptible Psalms. Now, on the one hand, notice... C.S. Lewis's reading actually projects into verse 5 the idea that the conflict between the guest and the host is finished. And the enemies are a thing of the past. So that what the, what the, what the guest is doing is triumphing in the presence of enemies. He, he, he's humiliating them by being vindicated in their presence. But of course, look at verse 5. It, it says nothing of that, does it? What if in verse 5 the conflict is actually ongoing? What if the conflict is growing here, not lessening? What if the guest is actually in great danger from his enemies as he eats, but he is eating to woo them and to warn them, not to belittle them or to degrade them? And on the other hand, I think the forth, forcefulness of C.S.'s reading, it really melts away when you see the Lord Jesus eating and drinking in the presence of his enemies. He, he is not humiliating them. He's seeking to humble them, isn't he? And in so doing, he shows his own humility. He, he's not gloating over his enemies. He's inviting his enemies. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, that the door is open to all. There is a ready, a wide, a, a capacious invitation to any who will come and eat and drink with him. All you need to do is know that you're lost. So, so the table is spread in the presence of his enemies. But it is precisely that, friends. It is a table. It, it is not a bar of justice in their presence, not yet anyway. It is not a sword not yet. It is a table where the Lord Jesus is defining the people of God around those who will recognize him as the true shepherd of Israel, the good shepherd. He is the now present with us, Emmanuel host of the messianic banquet, long promised in the prophets, passionately anticipated by God's people, a table with food and drink. A table is where covenants can be sealed, where fellowship is formed. It is where enemies can be reconciled as friends. And a table is where so many 
choose to seal their own rejection of Jesus, isn't it? Do you remember Judas? He went out into the night, but Judas went out with clean feet, and he went out with bread and wine in his belly. He left a table that a loving host had prepared in the presence of his murderous enemies. Brothers and sisters, look how the Lord Jesus welcomes you. He has displayed his complete, total sufficiency for all our needs, verses 1 to 3. His lavish love for the most wayward prodigal or most vile outcast, verses 5 and 6. See, Jesus' enemies are not people who have done bad things, and his friends are not people who have done good things. No, Jesus' enemies are people who cannot bear the fact that he eats with people who have done bad things. That's what makes you an enemy. But Jesus eats with people like me and you. His welcome is vast, it is free, it is sealed in blood, it is offered in bread and wine. How he welcomes. Number two, look what he sends. Look what he sends. Just look at the, the very first part of verse six. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. It seems a strange thing to say, doesn't it? Look what God sends. For there, there are these two things following us, goodness and mercy. If you look at, again, the ESV, if you look at the footnote down to the bottom, the footnote is steadfast love. Goodness and steadfast love shall follow me. God's covenant love follows me. God's covenant love is God's married love for his people. The kind of love that pursues a lover and goes after them. I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago, there's a lovely, lovely story in the news about Ron and Joyce Bond from Milton Keynes. Have you ever heard of Ron and Joyce Bond? If you haven't heard of them, you should have. Uh, back in January, a couple of years ago, they were Britain's longest married couple, celebrating 81 years of married life together. And at, at least not long ago, you could look them up and see them. They were 102 and 100 years old, respectively. The amazing thing is about that story is that people told them at their wedding, it won't last. <laughs> it won't last long. And, and when, when you look at the pictures online of Ron and Joyce Bond on their wedding day, and then you look at Ron and Joyce Bond now, 102 and 100 years old, what you are looking at is steadfast love, aren't you? Love that hasn't gone anywhere else other than after the other person. Love that has stayed and sought and stuck. It is the most beautiful picture, isn't it? After all this talk of us following the Good Shepherd, now in verse 6, we look back over our shoulder, and to our amazement, we see two things following us, goodness and mercy, steadfast love. Many preachers say it's like the shepherd has these two sheepdogs, and as he's out in the fields and we're following, he has these two little helpers following along behind him to do his work. But actually, I think it's even more wonderful than that, as good as that picture is. The, the reason I've called this point is, point, look what he sends, is because the Hebrew, the Hebrew verb for follow in verse 6, all the scholars tell us it is far too weak a word. It should be pursue. Goodness and mercy pursue me. Steadfast love pursues me. And goodness and mercy, steadfast love, these are covenant <coughs> nouns. That these words describe God himself in his attributes towards his people. It is God's goodness following you. It is God's steadfast love. And that means, friends, it is God himself pursuing you. God is his attributes. He doesn't have goodness that he can just send off into the night like a, a missile and leave it flying. He doesn't have steadfast love that he just parcels out and sends. God, God is behind you, pursuing you. If you like, verse 6 says, God is behind us, hunting us down, but hunting us down only to be good to us and only to be covenantally faithful to us. One of the great joys I have now with the age that our, our children are at is, is, is forcing them to watch old films that I thought were amazing. 
And one of the films I've done that with recently is The Fugitive. Do you remember that film with Har Harrison Ford? And they sit there like rolling their eyes and all the rest of it. And I'm saying, no, this is the best bit. This is the best bit. Remember the story, Richard Kimball, Harrison Ford plays Richard Kimball, a man wrongly accused of murdering his wife. And Kimball ends up on the run and he's hunted down, remember, by Tommy Lee Jones in the film. Tommy Lee Jones is the ruthless, determined police officer. And he will not stop. He's a man possessed. There's a, there's a bit right at the end. Remember the showdown where Tommy Lee Jones shouts across to Harrison Ford, Richard Kimball. He shouts across the room, doesn't he? I believe you. I know you didn't kill your wife. And you see the relief wash over Harrison Ford's face. He's vindicated. He's in the clear. Why? Because it turns out that the man who's been pursuing him is good. He's not a corrupt police officer. He's a good police officer. He's being pursued by goodness. Our oh, friends, human goodness can be amazing, can't it? Human steadfast love, 81 years of love can be amazing. But friends, Imagine being pursued by the Lord of the burning bush himself, the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus. See how amazing it is? As the shepherd, he leads us, and as goodness and mercy, he follows us. He is ahead of us, leading us to still waters. He is with us in the valley. He is behind us in goodness and love. Psalm 139, you hem me in behind and before. And we'd add, and at my side. Look, you pursue me all the days of my life, all the days, always, always, every single day. I don't know whether this is just us in our house. When, when we end up in a heated argument, I think it's common to all people. Uh, but you know when you end up in a really heated argument with someone who's very, very close to you, a family member, isn't it true you end up saying, don't you, come, the words come out of your mouth, you, you say, you always do that. You, you always do such and such. You, you always do this. And it's, once you find yourself saying that, it's usually a sign you've lost all perspective. It's, it's time to retreat, isn't it, and calm down before you say anything else. Somebody says, oh, here you are again. You always bring that up. You are forever doing this. You're always doing that. Brothers and sisters, can you see what David is saying? David is saying that to God but he's doing it in reverse. It is intense, it is personal, it is so direct in telling God what he always does, but it is the reverse of a, of a row. It, it is a love song. You always do this, Lord. You are always good to me. You are always merciful to me. We, I, we, we don't know when David wrote these words. I like to think he wrote them later in his life, after all that he went through. I think there's a good case for that with the the, the table in the wilderness, he's fed by close friends as his own son is seeking his head. Imagine David saying this, you are always merciful to me. I have blown it so many times, and yet you are always good, always merciful. Do you imagine saying to somebody, you know, you know the thing about you, you always get it right. You never get it wrong. You always do no wrong. You never commit injustice. You are always merciful. You are always compassionate. You are always kind. So, so beautiful, isn't it? The Lord, so perfect, so complete. I think this is a real lesson to us shepherds. I didn't say a lot about the staff yesterday. You remember the, the rod and the staff in the shepherd's hands, the difference between them, the rod had metal, uh, iron built into the head of it. It was a club for warding off enemies. The staff, a, a crook at the top to pull sheep back. Protection, discipline, correction. I think this is a real lesson to us shepherds. When you and I wield the rod or extend the staff for a sheep and pull the sheep back, as the sheep looks back over their shoulder, they need to see goodness and mercy pursuing them, don't they? I think many shepherds wonder why the sheep are bristling at our pastoral attention. Why, why are you upset that I'm coming after you? Maybe they feel more pursued by the under-shepherd's exasperation. 
than they feel pursued by the chief shepherd's loving kindness. And I think, friends, there's even more to it in verse 6, even more. Look at that little word at the start, surely. I think I told you this on first morning, didn't I? That, that's a little Hebrew word, a particle. It, it, it can be an affirmation, a promise. This is how it will be. Goodness and mercy will follow me. Surely it will happen. Or it can be only goodness and mercy. You have that in the footnote, don't you? A, a restrictive phrase. Re read the verse again. Only goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Only goodness and mercy will pursue me to the very end. Only. And you just have to stop, don't you, and say, really? Really? Only? But look at my life, Lord. Is it possible to believe this and live this? Ralph Davis tells the story, summer of 1680, Alan Cameron, the Covenanter, was in prison in Edinburgh. And he did not know that his son Richard had been killed in battle at Aird's Moss. A trooper opened the door of his prison cell and flung down in front of him a bloodied head and two hands and yelled to him, do you know whose these are? Cameron took the gory tokens upon his knees and held them. Yes, he said, they are my sons, my dear sons. And then he went on, good is the Lord who could never wrong me and who has made goodness and mercy to follow me all the days of my life. Ralph Davis says, it may stretch our minds, but valleys, verse four, and enemies, verse five, and apparently body parts, do not negate the truth of verse six a. Only goodness and mercy will follow me. I don't think you have to go as far back as 1680 to see that kind of faith. Many of you know the story of Helen Rosevere, the British medical missionary in the Congo. And years and years ago during an uprising, a strong, vital, young Christian woman. And yet in the midst of that uprising, she was brutally assaulted and raped. And commenting later on all that happened to her, she said, I must ask myself a question as if it came directly from the Lord can you thank me for trusting you with this experience, even if I never tell you why? There's the question for us. Can we still trust him, even if he never tells us why? Later on, Helen Roosevelt wrote this. She said, one word has become unbelievably clear to me, and that word is privilege. God didn't take away pain or cru cruelty or humiliation. No, it was all there, but now it is altogether different. It was for him, for him, in him. He was actually offering me the inestimable privilege of sharing in some little way the edge of the fellowship of his suffering. And in the weeks of imprisonment that followed what happened to me and in the subsequent years of continued service, looking back, I have tried to count the cost, but in fact, I find it all swallowed up in privilege. The cost suddenly seems very small and transient in the greatness and permanence of the privilege. I want to say to us this morning, friends, in a room this size, I want to say to us that I know you might have the most exemplary reformed theology in your head, but you are wondering why your heart cannot catch up with your head. Something has happened to you and you just cannot believe that only goodness and mercy are following you. And I want to say to you from this verse, that is okay, isn't it? That is okay. Some wounds are very, very deep. I want to remind you of the stance of the guest here in verse six. What is, what is he doing? Goodness and mercy are behind him. They, they are pursuing him. He is moving forward through the valley and it is only as he looks back over his shoulder, it is only as he looks back on events that he sees the goodness and steadfast love of the Lord in them. One day it may be that you look back on the worst of experiences, the most dreadful of days, the deepest of dark valleys, and only then do you say, oh, I see it now, Lord. 
Oh, how gentle the shepherd is. Johnny was telling me yesterday when I, I was speaking to him about the book that his, his wife, Jackie, has written about their loss of their daughter. He said as she began to write it, they realized that what she had to do was show, not tell. Show, not tell. You don't need a lecture or a sermon in pain, do you? You need someone to show you the goodness of God, to, to allow you to find it again yourself, to, to take you to it. So let's finish with this. Number three, look where, look where he invites. Look where he invites. The shepherd invites you to live in his home. Sometimes you go and visit somewhere, don't you, as a guest. You are, you are lavishly treated. You're, you're amazed at what's been laid out for you, the food, the hospitality, the, the surroundings, a luxury spa weekend or a, a five-star hotel. You go somewhere that makes you feel a million dollars. And of course, it dawns on you after a while, doesn't it, that the reason they're treating you like a million dollars is because they think you have a million dollars. They want your dollars. They, they don't want you. They want your money. They're treating you well because you're paying for it, not because they love you. But well, they do care about you if you can pay for it. And you realize that where you have been is not your home. The host is not your friend, not your shepherd. David says here, ima imagine just being pressed forward with the shepherd, in the shepherd in front of you, his goodness and mercy behind you, hemmed in safely all along the paths. And in that valley, all the way, you are heading to the shepherd's house. And now the door opens and you enter. And as you enter, you are told you are home. This is where you belong. Hang your hat. You're with me now. You, you belong here now. Oh, friends, the house of the Lord is beauty beyond compare. You will never, ever want to leave. You won't have to leave it. You will live there forever. Just look at the little footnote again, and I shall dwell. I think in my Bible, it's verse 9. It, it could be, I shall return to dwell. Isn't that beautiful? See, in one sense, this psalm is just the journey of a sheep in the morning, verse 1, out of, out of the fold, out into the hills, doing its rounds, the pastures, the valleys, the feeding places, the dangerous places, and then in verse 6, returning again to the fold at the end of the day. But th there's a deeper sense, isn't there, this language of, and I shall return to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Ever since the Garden of Eden, we have been exiled, haven't we, from the presence of God exiled from the dwelling place of the Lord. We live east of Eden. We are outside the garden, in the wilderness, traveling, journeying to the house of the Lord. And that journey is a return to Eden. You, you know that Solomon's temple was built to resemble the Garden of Eden. There were engravings on the walls of Eden. The fruit and the bounty and the harvest were put into the architecture around the building. The house of the Lord where God lives is the most beautiful place in the universe. And God is taking you there. If you have lost your loved one in Christ to the shroud of death, you need to know they are not lost to Jesus. He knows where they are. He knows where to find them. And he will come and get them and bring them home. If, if those you love in Christ this morning have fallen, he will gently pick them up and on his shoulder lay them. He will cause all his lost sheep to return. Never forget, friends, that the shepherd we belong to is the Lord of the burning bush whose undimming strength comes from his self-existence. The extent of his unending care comes from his self-sufficiency. He will not lose any of his sheep from his fold. The Lord Jesus has conquered our greatest enemies of sin and death by entering the valley of the shadow of death, by being forsaken by his Father, and by him having only the cup of cursing to drink, not the cup of blessing. On the cross he thirsted, his cup did not overflow. And yet in his entrance to death he emerged on the other side, victoriously alive, and now he is leading us home. In my Father's house are many rooms. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. Some of you know the writings of George MacDonald. And with this, with this I finish. George MacDonald wrote these beautiful words to Lady Mount Temple. Her husband had died in 1888. And he wrote these words to her. We are in a house with windows on all sides. On one side, the sweet garden is trampled and torn. The, the beach is blown down. The fountain is broken. You sit and look out and it is all very miserable. Shut the window. I do not mean forget the garden as it was, but do not brood on it as it is. Open the window on the other side where the great mountains shoot heavenward and the stars rising and setting crown their peaks. Down those stairs, look for the descending feet of the Son of Man coming to comfort you. This world, if it were alone, would not be worth much. I should be miserable already. But this world is the porch to the Father's home. And he does not expect us to be quite happy. And he knows we must sometimes be very unhappy until we get there. But we are getting nearer. Amen. Let's pray. Bring us, O oh Lord God, at our last awakening into the house and gate of heaven and to enter into that gate and dwell in that house where there shall be no darkness nor dazzling, but only one equal light, no noise nor silence, but one equal music, no fears nor hopes, but one equal possession, no ends nor beginnings, but one equal eternity in the habitations of thy glory and dominion, world without end, forever and ever. Amen.